RTE Radio 1 at 25 past 9. Looking West, our series about people, places and events in the West of Ireland is presented now by Jim Fahey. fellows behind the sandbags told us to, they held up their hands to tell us not to go and then at a given signal to go we took three or four hops and they pulled us in over the over the sandbags and if they did um, a whole hail of, of um, machine gun fire lit, lit the street Hello, good evening, and thank you for joining us once again. And in this week's programme, we look at an intriguing and indeed little-remembered chapter of Irish history, the story of the women of Common Naman, who, 60 or more years ago, donned the green uniform of rebellion and saw action on the streets of Dublin and in many other centres around the country. The woman you've just been listening to is Liberty's born Mrs Mary O'Connor, who's now in her 79th year but who still has the most vivid recollections of her days on the run in Dublin. Hers is a particularly poignant story too, as it underscores the bitterness and the tragedy of the civil war which split her own family right down the middle, and which saw her future husband-to-be order the Free State troops under his command to try to shoot her dead on Dublin's cobblestone streets in 1922. Mrs O'Connor now lives at Nuns Island in Galway, and a few days ago, she recalled for us her early days in Cumannamon and their training for rebellion. We were trained in first aid. We were trained to how to break a rifle or a revolver and, um, and close it again and how to keep them clean, how to mine them in for dumps. They had to be dumped. They were, well, they called them dumps, as uh, so places of security where they could be kept. And um, once we had uh, we had um, grenades in our house, and somebody said that the house was going to be raided, and uh, I took the basket of grenades, and I carried it around the block of our house, a whole block of houses, until my sister came to tell me where to bring them to for safety. You wouldn't dream of doing away with them or anything; they were too precious. But when I went up for my, for my uh, active service uh, certificate, uh, one of the referees asked me, how did I know whether it was a bomb or a, or a grenade? And I said, there, are, there, were, there were squares on the grenade. And they said, do you mean to tell me, he said, that, uh, you, that there was operations performed in your house? He said, well, there, well, there was a professional... Uh, uh, medical care. I said, I mean to tell you, I said, there were operations performed said, by medical students. And we never had anaesthetics or anything. So there was a field hospital in it your house? There was a field hospital there for, um, for the most part of the Black and Tan time. Coming back again to the question of your training, were, were you ever trained how to, to use guns? Or? No. No, they never trained us how to use guns. No. But they told us all about them and came to went to different houses for these different kind of... You couldn't go anywhere else, only to a private house that was safe. And they brought the gun and showed us how to break it. That's the word, they break it. And what happens, and so on. And how to keep them oiled and cleaned if they were there for any length of time. And um, we minded them, and we knew where they were. But you never learned how to, how to use the guns at all? Never. Never once. What about intelligence work? Presumably that was an important aspect of, of the common amount activity during that period. Well, I, I wasn't in intelligence during the, the Black and Tan much. My sister was, but I wasn't. But I, I was on intelligence in the, the Civil War. Would you like to hear that? Well, uh, at that time we were in Parnell Square. Uh, we were sent with the dispatch to the Hammond Hotel and we were told, uh, uh, my Miss Holden was her name, we were told that there was a sniper on the top of the LSE garage in uh, um, Richmond Street. 
uh, and that we'd had to cross there go, to go down by Belvedere and the roundabout to the, Hammond, the back of the Hammond Hotel. Well, when he stepped out there, it was like stepping into a vacuum. There wasn't a sound in the street, only, the, only of far away uh, gunfire and the, and the um, shriek of the gulls on the Liffey. We were in we were far from the Liffey. And we, when we got across, out of the fire of the sniper, the two of us walked on our toes because the sound of our heels seemed to, uh, to, give, to give us more shock than anything else. The sound of our own heels, the place was so still. It was like as if the whole city was holding its breath and that we were the only two in the whole place. So we got down to Gary Hoolahan. And Countess Markovic was there and Rory O'Connor and we gave our dispatch and, and Gary was delighted to see me because of course he was related and um, uh, I told him all the news I had and oh, he was thrilled and then uh, he said to me will you watch yourselves now going, uh, going out I said watch what so and so so and so he said did they not tell you he said that that place out there he said is all mine <laughs> <laughs> so he brought us over the mind parts and brought us to safety. So you were tiptoeing your way through, through a minefield, virtually? Through a minefield, that time. Blankly yes. unaware of, of Black, the risks? Yes, unaware. We didn't know a thing about the minefield that was outside at the back of the Hammond Hotel. And that's where I saw Rory O'Connor and um, and the Countess, I think, was there that, uh, that night. But we, we didn't delay, you see, because we had to get back to the, to the other place. What, what are your memories of either Rory O'Connor or the Countess? Uh, very, very vague in a way, because they were, um, they were the top people, you see, and we were only the, uh, we were only the messengers. And uh, we didn't have any, we didn't have any um, close uh, communication with them, you know except that we delivered what we were told to deliver. How, uh, didn't act deliver. How, how active a part or how important a part did Common Amon play, let's say, to begin with, during the War of Independence? Uh, I don't think they could ever have managed without them. The men couldn't have, because they were there at every, every hand. I know, for instance, outside Mount Joy, when Kevin Barry was being executed, all come the mom were kneeling down outside. You know, Kevin Barry was being hanged and he was only 18. And there was a great hue and cry and everybody thought there might be a reprieve on account of his youth. And everybody wished and hoped. And we went there at six o'clock in the morning and at eight o'clock, the armored cars uh, passed by the kneeling women up and down the kneeling, by, the, by the side of the kneeling women. And at eight o'clock, everybody still hoping, the prison officer came out and he, he pinned a paper onto the gate of Mount Joy. And uh, there was a huge gasp from everybody. It said on the paper that he had been hanged and that the prison doctor had pronounced him dead. And we were, in, we were very, everybody was very upset. And we had, to, we had to take up the threads of our own lives at the same time. It was on a holy day, 2nd of November, and we had to get to Mass and get to our places of work. So uh, we left the gate with this dreadful message on it, and we left the road to the armoured cars with our guns all sticking out and our softly purring engines. Did you ever hear the engine of, a, of a, an armoured car? It's a Rolls Royce and it, it just purrs. But it was in strong contrast to our outraged feelings because we felt that at least they could have shot him and not hanged him. We wouldn't have felt as bad if they shot him. And we all came away in terms of, I remember the nearest church to my, to my office was um, Michael and John's. And everybody was emotionally upset. 
everybody leaving the place. And we got to Michael and John's church, I was on my own. And I remember I, I couldn't see the priest on the altar because the tears were falling so copiously down on my hands, my folded hands. I couldn't see the priest on the altar. I was so emotionally upset. And then I had to pull myself together and open up this place and uh, open all the letters and, and um, draft out the answers for the boss. He didn't come until 10 o'clock and, and, and sit down as if nothing had happened. We were out from six o'clock. Had you that morning, had you still some lingering hopes that he might be given? Oh, yes, everybody had till the last minute because there was other countries involved as well. Other countries were pleading. I mean, it was uh, international. There was international plea for his life. He was so young. And you, you can still then remember that morning as vividly as, vividly. as yesterday? As yesterday. The 2nd of November? Yes, indeed. And uh, there's an... Uh, I have another story about uh, Mrs. Houston, if you'd like to hear it. Mrs. Houston was, was a great friend of our families. When she came down to Galway to see our, sis our, our, our daughter, who was Mother Bernard in, in Taylor's Hill, she always stayed with us. And she told us the story, and I got her to tell it to my friends about the night Sean was executed. When she saw the, uh, the, the British officer at the door, she knew, because her friend, the O'Hanrahan, had, be, had been executed the morning before, and she knew that Sean, this was for Sean. So the, the officer came to the door with a car and uh, took her, her and her sister and her daughter uh, to Kilmainham. She remembered it so vividly that uh, all, all the week of the rising, the sun shone brilliant in the sky. Uh, when the rising was over, uh, the rain came down very, very heavily. And when they came to all, the, the lights were all gone because the gas mains were broken and Dublin was in darkness. So when she came to the checkpoints, she remembers the shine of the rain on the, on the, the coats of the soldiers. They weren't coats, they were um, oil sheets. And she remembers that when they came up to the flares. So they were brought along up to Kilmainham and he, all down the corridor to Sean's cell. And when she went into the cell, her, her son, who was a, a Dominican student at the time, had, had with him a Dominican priest. And the two white figures were in the cell when she arrived and there was a candle. The candle. So they had a little talk with him and for as long as they were allowed. And then the soldiers said, though somebody started crying down there, somebody distraught was crying down the corridor and um, uh, the priest wanted to go out to a comfort wherever it was and he wouldn't be let. So then afterwards an officer came down and asked the priest to go up to this person who was upset. It was one of the other women's uh, husband. But uh, they were in the cell with Sean, had, uh, uh, saying the last words and having their little goodbyes and talk. And he wrote a lovely letter to his sister that was published afterwards, Mother Bernard, she's dead now too. Anyway, she said for her, the whole crucifixion of the evening was the fact that they took the lone candle out of his cell to, to light them down the corridors of Kilmainham and left him alone in the darkness with only a few hours to live. And she used to tell that so bravely that, you know, you would, she was a real noble kind of woman, person, and uh, very, very, very um, convinced that she did the right thing and because of what she had written and so on. Her concern then in his last hours was very much uh, for her son, mm -hmm. uh, that he should be left alone in an unlighted darkness. cell, in waiting, awaiting his fate. Mm -hmm. Waiting, uh, it was shot at six o'clock the following morning, I think, so at six o'clock. <gasps> and that must be after twelve. There were obviously days of almost indescribable anguish and despair and heartbreak for the people caught up in the events of the time. Indescribable is the word. There's, there's, it's, it was absolutely dreadful. Everybody then after that. Of course, they, they, the cause hadn't, hadn't become famous at all up to then. 
the shooting of the men brought everybody to, to the cause. And then everything was for the cause. No sacrifice too great, no sacrifice too great. And no money, we never thought of money or, or, or inconvenience or anything like that. No, nothing like that ever entered in. We ran fates, uh, you know, my mother had charge of a, of a tea stall, and when she sent somebody very fashionable and everybody was in it. But those, those first few weeks before um, a sense of outrage swept the country, they were obviously weeks of, of loneliness and weeks of... Desperate. For the people, for the people involved, for the Houstons and the Hanahans and all the, these. Victor time, and there was no money to keep them. We've been talking of the the tragedies of, of that particular that particular week, those particular months. What about the triumphs? The triumph of having of uh, of the triumph of failure, of course, in one way. Um, the triumph was that we, we that that we um, managed to um, rise the people, rise the people to to a uh, to a sense of um, importance about this thing, and to, to rally them, and it did rally them. It became very big then. There was, if I was in the fourth battalion, there was one. 1st Battalion, 2nd Battalion, 3rd Battalion, 4th Battalion, and I think there was a 5th Battalion in the Dublin Brigade alone. And then they, then they were all linked up with the, the country. Did, did you see yourselves at that time as being very small and very isolated and almost very, very helpless? In the beginning, or, yes. Or did you have a coherent philosophy of what you were doing? Did you have a clear idea that you were going to succeed? Yes. Oh, yes. That was, that was there all the time. <sighs> And the burning of the custom house was the was the final, and uh, the burning of the custom house was a personal thing for us also. My brother, everybody was on it. Most of the Dublin Brigade were there, and my place of business is here in Wellington Quay. Do you know the Clarence Hotel? Very close to the Clarence Hotel, and I'm on the north side of the quays. And the custom house is burning. We saw the dome falling in because the bus. If you thought it was in Cundamon, I'd have been shunted. But he, he was dead against us. He was just giving out and saying, they, oh, it's easy, it's easy enough for them. They have nothing to lose. And I, my heart was breaking because I, I knew that everybody in it, almost everybody in it, and, and we were getting rumours that, there swim, that, that uh, some of them had to sw swim the Liffey, which they did. Uh, a loyal load of tans passed uh, just as they were in the act and uh, caused the whole thing to be a, a terrible outrage. But they, they did burn it, and my brother was in there. And the civilians were told to keep in, not go near the windows. And one of the civilians did, didn't do that, and my brother had to take him and um, uh, say an act of contrition in his ear. And his blood was on his clothes, so and he, he was arrested afterwards. And he was he would have been shot only the treaty came. Your personal dilemma was that all during that period for four or five years, um, you were madly in love with a man who took the free state side and you were strongly Republican. I wasn't in love at all. <laughs> that was <the> trouble. <laughs> oh no, I wasn't in love. He was madly in love and and With it you. frightened me so much that I, I thought I should feel the same about him. And, and I held back altogether. I didn't want to have anything at all to do with it, you see. I had that personal dilemma all the time, but I, it wasn't on my side. Unfortunately, I, I, it would, would have been better if, if it was. You, your husband-to-be, Sean O'Connor, was yes. on the Free State side. Now, tell me the story of the incident when some of his troops fired on you as you tried to make your way, uh, I think it was from Parnell Square down towards Cable Street, wasn't yes, it? Yes, towards Cable Street. We, we, we got uh, opposite Jenkinson's potato stores that was barricaded with our fellas inside. And we came out of Side Street right opposite um, Jenkinson's potato store. And uh, we were, they 
the pillars behind the sandbags told us to, they held up their hands to tell us not to go. And then at a given signal to go, we took three or four hops and they pulled us in over the, over the sandbags. And if they did, um, a whole hail of, of um, machine gun fire lit, lit the street. Now, we didn't know where it came from or anything. Uh, the, uh, the business of it. But it, it transpired that it was Sean O'Connor's troops had posted the troops in, in a house down lower down in Cable Street uh, to fire on anything they saw going into Jenkins Potato because our fellows had shot some of their some of their men that were outside the um, the uh, four courts, mm. the Free State. They were outside the four courts. See, they was a flank movement. I forget the I forget the thing. They made a flank movement coming round here behind them to, to get at these, so that these these Free State troops were, were distracted and not uh, fired so much uh, into the four courts because the four courts was getting very weak at the time. Your two brothers, Jack and Jim, were on the... They had taken the Free State side in the Civil War. They were, they were outside the four courts. They were taking part in the bombardment of the four courts. Yes, that's right. And yet many of your closest friends and some of your relations were, were on the inside, on the inside, Republican side. Inside, certainly, yes. You were saying to me that this, for you, and especially for your mother, mm. epitomised the tragedy of the Civil War. Exactly, because she was a neutral. She was one of God's neutrals, like, you know. She had the bands of my father about Ireland, you see, and she would do a good turn for anybody. She was a tremendous character, and uh, she she kept praying for the fellows outside, and then when she thinks of the fellows inside, that disturbed her as well, so she prayed for them. And she kept up a litany all the time, <laughs> about the two of them, the insides and the outsides. I remember well hearing her saying, Jesus, Mary and Joseph were Jehovah, Jack and Jim. They were outside the four courts. And then she, another burst of shell fire, and she'd think of the fellows that were inside, that are on the run in our house for so long. And she said, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, watch over me, Walker, and so and so, so and so, so and so. And she kept up this litany because her heart was broken. Totally broken over that uh, the situation. It was so tragic. Coming back again to your own personal story, then there was Sean O'Connor on the on the Free State side, mm -hmm. uh, madly in love with yes. you. Yes, you were very much involved on the Republican side, and for four or for five years, mm. this went on. It went on. Mm. How did you eventually resolve it? Was there some story of, of a priest? Being... Yes. Well, I had a, well. Uh, it was. Uh, my bro my brother was his best friend for one thing, the O'Connors and the and the Harpers. And he wrote to me and at one time and he said, um, evidently I I hadn't played ball. I, I, I didn't recognise Sean because he's in, in uniform. And uh, Sean went back to wherever he was in Clonmel or somewhere, and um, in a very bad frame of mind about me. And Jim wrote to me in a, a, a real brotherly letter. And in the end, he said, do you not know that, that, that you have the best man in the world to either make or mar? <laughs> he said, do something about it. But I didn't at that time, because I, I felt uh, that I hadn't, hadn't the right to, uh, because he, he was, uh, he was um, so insistent. Then uh, I had a crisis of conscience another time. I had two, two, two crises of conscience. One was at the time uh, when the guns went out of our house and ambushed Jim, who was up from the country. He was a staff officer coming down from Portobello Barracks, and he, he was ambushed in Thomas Street. And the fellows that um, ambushed him were, were um, on the run in our house and the guns were taken out of our house. So the guns, mm. point, which ended up pointing at your brother, yes. had been had been stored in your own house. I was so upset about that, that uh, I remember I went out for a walk, 
and I found myself at the uh, at the uh, park gate, and I don't know how I ever got there. I was so upset. The other crisis of conscience was about uh, Sean O'Connor because it was a uh, it was coming up. He was like a he was like a barrister with a brief standing with the brief <laughs> there all the time, turning up and just listening, saying nothing sometimes, only being there. And what brought you up to Dublin? Well, I didn't come up to see the stones on the street, things like that, you know. And uh, then in the end, um, I had to take my problem to the to the, this priest who was a personal friend, confessor, and a great friend of my mother's. And um, I told Father Creedon, He's a very well-known uh, priest in the Legion of Mary. He was the first spiritual director. And I told Father, and he knew Sean O'Connor, and he knew my mother, and he knew the whole story. And he said to me, Mary, you will have to let Sean O'Connor take you out. He said, because, he said, he's a good man, and it could be God's will for you. That's exactly what he said. It could be God's will for you. And when he said that, I said, well, we better let, let this go. <laughs> so we went out for walks around the park. <laughs> and all. So and eventually then, I resigned Cumnamon. All Cumnamon knew about it, and all had great pity for the whole situation, you know. They knew the whole thing, and um, they were feeling about it. And um, I resigned, and I told them why I was resigning. And they said, well, fair play, they that uh, it's the right thing to do. You couldn't have um, an officer in the army and an officer in Cumnamon <laughs> taking off together. <laughs> Could, wouldn't do. So, so love uh, and romance triumphed in the end. In the end, <laughs> and triumphed very, very well. It, it sounds so much like the plot of, of a novel or a play or a short story. If, if only I had the bit that I've written. It's still in court that they're, um, they're having it um, tight. If you read what, what's written, that's when you'd know, because I can't remember and I'm uh, slipping in spots, you know. The whole thing, oh, that thing about the, the romance, uh, it, it, it beat like a tattoo, you know. I, I was uh, sent, sent um, from the office. I had to take papers to the auditors in Dame Street. And if you found the street, it's up from Wellington Quay. I came up, I came up found the street with these papers to bring them to Mr. Maxwell in Stephen's Green, who was the auditor. And there was a stop press. You never heard of stop press. Well, in these times, there were no tel television or radio or anything, but uh, it, it, uh, the Evening Mail put out a stop press um, paper. And the, the little fellas were shouting it all over the place. Stop press, stop press, stop press. They shouted it all over Dublin. And I I bought one, and I read in it that um, uh, Commandant Kelly and Captain... Uh, Commandant, Commandant Kelly and Captain Sean O'Connor had been captured in, in Tipperary, and that Commandant Kelly was killed, but they didn't know anything about Captain O'Connor. So I took that paper and I put it into my bag. And Mr. Maxwell said to me, he was a great old gentleman, he, was a, he said, well, well, Miss Harper, he said, uh, still no more bad news. And I said, well, little does he know what, <laughs> what it means to me. <laughs> I had the thing in my bag. But there was a telegram the next day to say that he had, that he had escaped from wherever they were in uh, captures. I forgive part of temporary it was. What did your, your family, your father and mother, think at the time of your involvement with Common Amon and subsequently your romance with this fairly senior Free State officer? My mother and father, well, they were very fond of him, first of all, because he was a very gentle, nice kind of a guy, you know, and his, and his brother and his whole family. We knew their whole family and they were very high in our estimation, you know, and um, the only disrespect that my father would uh, show to them in their uniforms was not to speak to them. He wouldn't speak to them. He would he pretend not to see them. 
Mm. If they came into the house, he meant the house to be neutral, but it, it went against the grain when you saw them in uniform. How did he feel, for instance, or, or did he become aware of the fact that the guns were taken out of your house to, to ambush your own brother? He knew. He knew. And um, my sister was married to Paddy Hurahan, and um, uh, the way we had to, he was in his pram, and there was wells in the pram that time. We had any amount of stuff hidden in the wells of the pram. That child slept on ammunition and everything, you know. Well, people had to take risks, Jim. It was kind of, um, kind of, uh, you're in it, and you, you, you had to take respons responsibility. I think it made a great generation of people because everybody had to accept responsibility very early on. Well, looking back on that period now, looking back at the, the towering figures of that period, how, how do they seem to you now from a distance of 60 or Absolutely almost 70 years? The towering figures they gave over a beautiful country it was absolutely lovely. It had its own culture, it had its everything going for it. And somebody or other, somewhere, money crept in. And money spoiled the whole thing. Now, the first government was pretty steady. The W. T. Cosgrave. It was pretty steady and uh, knew what it was about. After that, I think they got, they got, the, they lost their hair. They were like children who got too many toys and they didn't know how to use them. And uh, I'm sorry that, it, that things have turned out the way they did. <laughs> well. if, if this generation knew exactly what was suffered in those days, now, they couldn't possibly but take note of it. As it is, nobody cares. It's it's gone into the um, it's gone into the, the money market. Where do you think that had its roots? After all, you say you were quite satisfied with the government of W. T. Cosgrave. Mm. Um, are you talking about 1927 or 1932 or when, as you would see it, did that decline set in? 1921, 1922. Let's say 1924 about. That was still during the period of the Common and Male government. Mm. It was, was creeping in. No, I'm not good on dates, Jim. And so uh, I, I couldn't be certain about dates. <sighs> but, but what about, for instance, the um, early Fianna Fáil governments, the period of, of Eamon de Valera? Surely uh, his view of the Ireland, which he was trying to, to bring into being, would have coincided very much with your own. Yes, in the beginning. Yes, but at, at the same time, um, when he started out, uh, he said he would never, f it's a small thing, that he would never wear a tall hat. But after all, it came about. Sartorial servilitude, as <laughs> the man put it to me once. <laughs> Sartorial. Well, I mean, uh, I think they, they that, that the money element uh, crept in somewhere. Are, are you very disillusioned? N not, not very, uh, not very, but um, sad about the whole thing. I'm sad when I think of all that was suffered and all the people that are in their graves, you know, and that, uh, and sad about the the way uh, the furs have gone in in this country that they, we didn't hold on. We had a destiny, and I think that we we threw it away. I don't know how or when, but I feel that it has, it has been thrown away. Is now in the National Museum.